everyone, in this short video, we're going to have a little introduction to harmony music and a little peek at band history. Starting in the Baroque era, this was the time when composers started actually writing for specific instruments. So if you remember back to the Renaissance era, composers didn't specify what instrument would play what part. So even though we have music that's predecessors to band music, it's just like maybe you play it on recorder, maybe you play it on sham, no one really cares. Around 1675, the instruments started to be built that looked a lot more like the modern instruments that we have today. And that's why we can have the music from the Baroque era and play it on our modern instruments today. So at this time in the Baroque era, harmony music were pairs of oboes, bassoons, and horns. And that's actually a pretty cool sound. It's a pretty full sound when you hear the music from that time. And um, we also had instrumental music performing in things like civic bands and church bands. Moving on to the classical era, this ensemble developed even more. So we had more music written for the harmony music ensemble, consisting mostly of two oboes, two bassoons, and two horns. And an evidence, sort of evidence that this was an important ensemble is that both Mozart and Haydn wrote for this ensemble. And they wouldn't do that if it was just some like fly-by-night sort of ensemble. There were also really large wind bands in Paris, including one that might have had up to like 1,200 musicians for the first anniversary of Bastille Day, July 14th of 1790. Moving on to the Romantic era, we had a challenge because unlike the orchestra that had standard instrumentation, there was no standard instrumentation for the band or for an instrumental ensemble that kind of was like a band. So that meant that a lot of the music from this time would be transcriptions of orchestral works. And they'd be specific to the actual ensemble that was going to perform them because they had whatever the instruments were that it was being transcribed for. A couple other things that happened in the Romantic era. 1798, the U.S. Marine Band, which was the first U.S. military band, uh, was started. We saw that the harmony music started to wane in the Romantic era because the Romantic era favored large ensembles. But there's a really cool piece, uh, Charles Gounod's Petite Symphony. It's absolutely probably one of my favorite pieces with this type of instrumentation. It is for pairs of oboes, pairs of clarinets, pairs of bassoons, pairs of horns, and one flute. It's absolutely beautiful. At this time, bands also started to be more for performance than function. So function at this time might have been uh, that the band played at noon, so everyone knew it was noon. At this time, we had things like German bands, which would feature things like beer and music, and in England, we had brass bands. Moving on into the modern era, the late 1800s to early 1900s, there were over 10,000 amateur and professional bands in the United States, but those disappeared, a lot of them, by the end of World War I. This time was also a time in the late 1800s, early 1900s, that there was that struggle of what really is the instrumentation for the band. So in the 1920s, instrumentation for the band was standardized. And that was huge because that meant that in the 1920s, people could actually start writing music for band and it would be good for more than just one person's band. When we think about the history of the orchestra and we compare it to this modern standardization of the instrumentation for band, we can see why there's so many orchestral works out there for, you know, centuries and we see that the band literature is a lot more recent, unless we're looking at arrangements or transcriptions. In the modern era, we look at college bands as the models for younger bands. So again, instead of like the orchestra where we could look at the Pittsburgh Symphony or something like that as a model, we don't really have as many uh, professional bands out there in the world. So I have a couple listed there. Um, later on this uh, professional wind bands later on this slide, but mostly we're looking at the really good college bands as models. 1952 is important for the band because that's when the Eastman Wind Ensemble was founded. And that is the, the main principle there is one person, one player on a part. So it's a smaller wind ensemble 
than the symphonic wind ensembles that often colleges have today. In 1957, the American Wind Symphony Orchestra was established in Pittsburgh. And this ensemble, super important because of the huge number of works that they commissioned, more than 350 works. And they would actually float up and down the rivers on a barge and play their concerts. So that's kind of fun too. The last thing I have here on this slide is New Horizons. So New Horizons ensembles are focused on retired folks, mainly geared toward adults who never played an instrument before, but certainly adults who maybe haven't played in a long time. They, they can participate in New Horizons bands as well. But it's, it's geared toward retired folks um, for social reasons, so they have you know something to do. It's also good for them physically in terms of dexterity and using their lungs and things like that, and uh, cognitively as they're learning new instruments. Finally, just a couple things when we're talking about band and we're talking about history and we're talking about um, some of the instruments, not, not in this case, not oboes or bassoons, but certainly flutes, we have the marching arts. So in 1887, Notre Dame was the school that had the first marching band. We look at the 1970s when DCI or the Drum Corps International started, and we have a variety of different indoor ensembles that we have today, like winter guards and drum lines. So thank you for watching this little introduction to harmony music and then a little tiny peek at some of the other things that grew out of that small, small, small ensemble to become the bands that we have today. Thanks for watching.